What I'm going to talk about specifically is the weaponization of human rights in international law. We've just heard Ben talk about how the IDF is very careful in what it does in order to stay within the frameworks of international law, and how many of the accusations that are made are in fact false, entirely false. This is a massive industry. This is something that's been going on for 25 years, and the purpose is very clear. And we saw it again yesterday when Israel was blamed immediately in the New York Times, in the BBC, by NGOs, by diplomats, to, that for bombing a hospital, deliberately bombing for a strike, it was turned, an Israeli strike against a hospital in Gaza. The whole purpose of all of these claims, many of which have been false, this is not the first time, probably one of the worst examples, but not, not at all the first time, to turn Israel into the image of the world's worst human rights violator. In the United Nations and the Human Rights Council, four times a year, at least, Israel is condemned with resolutions and reports, far more than most of the other countries combined, more than Russia and Ukraine, of course, more than Syria, more than many other countries where there are conflicts. This is a not just a tactic, it's a strategy. It's a strategy that is the modern anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism, Jew hatred, it all goes together. Using, abusing the language, manipulating the language, the frameworks, the institutions of human rights, the ones that were created in the wake of the Holocaust. It's a form of Holocaust inversion. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights, on which this entire structure is built, that was adopted by the United Nations in 1948, it's the 75th anniversary in early December, was done, was written in the shadow of the Shoah of the Holocaust to guarantee never again. And it is that declaration and the institutions that were created on that basis that, has been, that have been weaponized against the Jewish people and against Israel. We need to understand that. And then we also need, and I'll spend a few minutes talking about how we can fight that, how we can deal with that successfully, in my view. But it's important for us to understand the phenomenon. The way in which Israel's turned into aggressors, monsters, and Palestinian murderers, genocidal mass murders, and people who commit terrible massacres are turned into victims. The human rights institutions, the people who are called the most respected experts, the, the frameworks, the NGOs, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty, the United Nations Human Rights Council, are propagandists for this campaign. Their goal, not only to turn Israel and the Jewish people into monsters, but also to prevent Israel from being able to defend its citizens. Because everything that Israel does is condemned as a violation of human rights. And that's also one of the reasons that Israel did not was not prepared to deal with the onslaught that we saw two weeks ago, because every time Israel seeks to disarm Hamas, to fight back against there, Hamas has 30,000 rockets, 30,000, which they made by stealing humanitarian aid. Every one of those rockets is a double human rights violation. It's a double violation of international law. They're aimed at Israeli civilians, which is obviously a violation of international law, but they're also placed under houses and in sco under schools and under mosques and under health clinics and all of those places. All those are violations of international law. Does the, quote, international community care about that? Do they condemn? Do they take any action? No. And that's something that we need to hold those people who claim to promote human rights responsible for. We've heard year after year, month after month, allegations of Israel committing war crimes, of abusing children, of apartheid. That was the big theme in the last five years. If you accuse a country of apartheid and you claim to have evidence, but you're really saying it has no right to exist. Apartheid countries have no right to exist. Israel being placed into the category of the apartheid regime in South Africa. And that we see this over and over and over again. The Gaza hospital incident we saw last night, it's more than an incident. The automatic headlines, 10, 15 minutes after the, what they call the Gaza Health Ministry or Health Services, that's a Hamas propaganda organization. The, hum, the New York Times has a headline, Israel bombed in a hospital in Gaza, 500 dead. They changed it slowly overnight because they were embarrassed and they were forced to acknowledge the truth. The BBC 
I don't think has even done that much. CNN says, well, we have a now an Israeli version and a Palestinian version, giving them equal weight. And that's how the human rights industry works. Let me say a few words about the details of the human rights industry. Who, who are doing, who is responsible? What are the, this is a very, very powerful industry. I talk to a lot of people. I've been doing this for over 20 years. And most people look at this, at, at the organizations as voluntary, as being uh, standing up against the powerful governments that violate human rights, groups like Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, all the Palestinian groups, Oxfam. Amnesty International has a budget of over $300, $350 million a year. It's far more than any State Department or Israeli foreign ministry or any, and they use the amount of money and resources and staff members that they focus on attacking Israel, on these false allegations, on what we call the lethal narratives of Israeli violations, is hugely disproportionate to any other part of the world, mixed very often with fundamental theological historical anti-Semitism, blood libels, repeated time after time. Human Rights Watch, based in New York, has an annual budget over $100 million, has almost the identical agenda as Amnesty. Their reports and Amnesty's reports are almost identical. A few years ago, Amnesty issued a what they called a breakthrough report demonstrating that Israel's an apartheid state. Human Rights Watch followed a year later. Both were covered in major articles in the New York Times within hours after they were put online. And none of the journalists who wrote this had any time to examine hundreds of dozens of pages with hundreds of footnotes. We looked at those. And it's re recycled propaganda, all of them quoting each other. And they form a major part of this community. You add to that at least 50 Palestinian human rights organizations. And I use that very, very cautiously. These aren't human rights organizations. They appear in the United Nations. They're quoted in the media. Reuters ran a story about Al Haq condemning yesterday's terrible Israeli lethal attack on a Gaza hospital, violation of international law, all of that. And they called Al Haq a respected Palestinian human rights organization. Al Haq and another 15 similar organizations are part of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine terror network. Eight of them have been designated by the Israeli government. The ones in Gaza, because it's outside of Israel, have not been designated. But you can see in NGO monitors traced their close connection with the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. These are not human rights organizations, yet they take the floor time after time in Geneva at the Human Rights Council. They speak in parliaments. Their representatives speak in, in the US Congress in testifying committees, they're not exposed the way they should be as part of this terrorist front with no credentials, no basic capability of assessing any kind of human rights uh, um, standing. There are close to 50 of these kinds of organizations that are funded primarily by European governments and by the UN to promote this agenda. And then there's the United Nations itself with a number of different frameworks, but particularly the United Nations Human Rights Council. The Human Rights Council meets four times a year. It has a permanent agenda. There is one country that is a focus of the permanent agenda, I, permanent item seven, and that is Israel, which means that four times a year and in emergency sections more often, there is speaker after speaker, the same NGOs, the same kind of language, the same kind of false claims that are presented, and they become the basis for the United Nations Human Rights Council reports condemning Israel for human rights violations. Many of you may remember Richard Goldstone. His name was on a report in 2009 that accused Israel back then of human rights violations, systematic violations of international law, war crimes, crimes against humanity, based almost entirely on the false and unverified claims of the same non-governmental organizations. The United States has called out the Human Rights Council on a number of times. Under President uh, George W. Bush, 
and later of President Trump, the United States left the Human Rights Council, recognizing that it was an entirely false framework that was doing more damage to human rights than in, um, in promoting human rights. And that's something that now the Biden administration has returned to the Human Rights Council. And they said at the time, and Secretary of State Blinken said, we are returning to the Human Rights Council in order to improve, to battle, to call out the focus on Israel, the bias against Israel, the obsession with Israel. In order to fight against this, we need to be informed. We need to have the evidence of what is actually going on and the lies that are being expressed and circulated by these organizations. It's a slow process because the world doesn't want to hear that, hear that. The journalists that I speak to start off by saying, well, you're a propaganda organization, you're affiliated, which is false, with the Israeli government. They do the propaganda. But time after time, they're embarrassed by reprinting false claims. You need to go to the, the diplomats, the political leaders, the academics, and show them case after case. And finally, we need to cut off the funding. Amnesty International should not be getting $350 million a year. Human Rights Watch should not be getting $110 million a year from donors who should know better, but don't check. They have these dinners that are held and they raise hundreds of thousands of dollars in New York, in Chicago, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Toronto, Sydney. And I think there we need to be far more active in showing all those people who are still providing them with this funding that they are in fact contributing to enabling of genocidal terrorism, as we saw two weeks ago. This is not human rights. It is the opposite of human rights, and it needs to be called out. Thank you.